This week, Star Citizen Alpha 2.2.1 is out, and bounty hunters are heading to Crusader in force. We chat with community content creator Board Gamer about his YouTube tutorials. Our partners at Behavior share their growing space plant collection. And we explore the galaxy with Sherry Heiberg and our lore writers. All this and more in this week's Around the Verse. Weapon yet. I do not. Um, I. It's a great system. It's it's really cool that we're not having you know ships getting randomly stolen constantly. Uh, but uh, I I cannot bring myself to be a bad guy in video games. I'm just I, I genuinely feel morally bad when I <laughs> do that. So Aww. no laser weapon here. Ben is our good guy all around. Welcome to Around the Verse, your weekly look at what's happening in the Star Citizen world. I am Sandy Gardner, and I run the marketing at Cloud Imperium Games. I'm Ben Lesnick. I'm uh, director of ship development. And Ben, what can we do in Star Citizen today? Well, dogfighting, dogfighting, and more dogfighting. It's uh, plenty of space combat with a little bit of ground combat thrown in. Um, we've kicked off uh, Alpha 2.2 for our mini PU, or Persistent Universe, which lets people sample the kind of nucleus of what Star Citizen will become. Um, you can crew multi-crew ships together, you can fly missions together, there's FPS uh, ground combat on the various stations. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, we also have uh, dogfighting and arena commander, and uh, you can explore our first planet side location in our corp. It's not just dogfighting though, really. It's a lot more than I know. Yeah. No, dogfighting is the basis, and then we're kind of you know, building it around that. I, I more recently just like to kind of goof off and fly around other than dogfights. So. Which is cool because it, you know, so many MMOs recently have been just here, do this quest, do this quest, you know, earn, earn, earn gold, earn gold. You know, the, the great example for me was Ultimate Online where I would just log in and I would be like a fisherman or I would hang out with my friends or something and you know, Star Citizen kind of reaches for that and we, let's get in there. I would like to be your local AAA person. <laughs> yeah. In case your ship breaks down, then I get to be a mechanic that I always wanted to be. I will have to get you a crucible. Yeah, there you go. Star Citizen Alpha 2.2 went live last week, and the team is working on a smaller patch to address some of the technical issues we've discovered with this release. As long as everything goes according to plan, we will be seeing 2.2.1 very shortly. Yes, um, I want PTU first, but uh, soon after to live. What else is happening? The Saber and the Jean Scout are available in the Pledge Store right now uh, through Monday. This is in honor of the fact that the Saber is flight ready with 2.2, and the Jean Scout is now available in hangars. So uh, if you're interested in either of those ships, you can pick them up. We also have the Saber on the Rec Store. If you're interested in trying it out, you can earn Rec in Arena Commander to do just that. The February 2016 monthly report is now live. Backers can pour over lots and lots and lots of details about Star Citizen's development. And we have it on good authority that there's a surprise or two hidden in there. Something about Big Benny's song. Hmm. We're also happy to announce that 2.2 has brought out not one, but two stretch goals. The J-SPAN cooler is available to everyone now, as is the Jean Space Plant. And uh, there's also some more interesting facets of the space plant which will make themselves appear uh, down the line so keep watching that space plant. We kicked off filming of Star Citizen's making of documentary this week by shooting talking heads of Chris Roberts. We began the process by putting Chris in front of a camera and asking him to talk about the early days of Star Citizen and the result was some fascinating footage. Thanks to Tom Hennessy and his team for making the shoot a great success. We'd like to thank everyone who came out to the Bar Citizens events that were held in uh, Santa Monica, Austin, Manchester, and Frankfurt. Uh, it sounds like a great time was had by everybody. Check out the pictures. 
I had a lot of fun at the LA one. I had a lot of fun too, and I was there with you. So yeah, so there was a really good turnout. Mm -hmm. It was really quite cool. Our our backers are amazing, and as, as I said at the time, it's letting the team interact directly with them. It energizes everybody. It makes us you know believe all the more in what we're doing. Um, we're really grateful to all you guys out there making this game possible, whether you can make it to a Bar Citizen or not. Yeah, and I enjoyed how everybody wore Star Citizen or Squadron 42 stuff. It was very cool. Because I didn't feel left out. I showed up by myself, and everybody was there. It was nice. And do you see what I have? Yes. Yes. Dog tags. They are going to go up on sale as of tomorrow. They're tomorrow at 1 o'clock Pacific, we'll be kicking off our uh, new style of dog tags uh, specific to Squadron 42. So the layout's a little bit different. It's got the Squadron logo, and it's got... Uh, your you know, Navy serial number and so on. Um, if you'd like one of those, yeah. tomorrow at one. If I go out flying as a criminal, then I'm gonna put one of these in my boots. <laughs> I've heard that's how it's supposed to work. Exactly. Now let's go to our teams around the world and see what they've been up to this week. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Los Angeles. You're here with Eric Kyron Davis and Patrick Matthew. We've got a bunch of cool new updates for you, but the first one is uh, this gentleman to my left just started with us this week and we're very excited to have him. Uh, and so I wanted to have him come on the news and tell us quickly what his first task was. So he's working alongside lead engineer um, Paul Rindell. And uh, so Patrick, what is one of the first things Paul has you tasked with? All right, so the first thing I'm doing is taking um, like a vehicle power plant item and porting it over to the, the new item system you guys already have going on. Yeah. So that's basically task. I think I'm going to be working with Chad because he's already ported over a few other items. So Cool. Awesome. That's great. And then on the other side of the building, we're working on several different pieces of art. We've got the uh, heavy going back into concepting and concepting phase, which is uh, very exciting. Jeremiah Lee is working on that. And then on the tech content side, we're working on component LOD pass as well as just LODs in general. Those are always a big part of the process for us to make sure we opt. It's, a, it's kind of an optimization pass for the tech content team. So that's the quick news from LA. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, again, I'm Eric. I'm Patrick. See you guys next time. Hello, Tyler Whitkin here, Senior QA in the Austin, Texas studio. Wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update about how things are going over here. Uh, it's been a crazy couple of weeks. Live Ops and QA have been burning the midnight oil in order to get 2.2 in y'all's hands. Um, luckily, we were able to do so at the end of last week. There's still a few issues we're concerned about, some stability, some desync. Uh, some, some issues with the 300 series and a few others. Um, but we're actively testing those fixes as they come online and hopefully we'll have those fixes in your hands very soon so we can consider it squashed and then pick up momentum and run with, uh, run with it towards 2.3. Uh, we're actively testing 2.3 right now in our game dev stream which will eventually will branch out um, which will become patch 2.3. Um, on the animation side of things, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. They're currently working on the NPC world population animation sets. Um, so things like the Astro Armada set, the G-Loke bar, the Living Citadel, etc. Um, so lots of cool stuff like that that'll help bring the world to life. Um, they're also working on some Squadron 42 animations, uh, some animation sets for Mark Hamill. And then of course, uh, very exciting stuff with the Starfare, some animations for ladders uh, and stuff like that. Uh, additionally, we've got some continued development for persistence, which is something I'm really looking forward to. Um, and our back-end engineers have been uh, feverishly working to accomplish their goals with that. Um, from a design perspective, lots of cool work being done on the shopping front with Cassaba, and then also a lot of work being done with the economy. Um, they're actually doing like a deep dive study into what ship components cost for ships in real life so they can better gauge um, what pricing should look like in-game for various ship parts and ships. Um, but yeah, that's all that's going on this week. Uh, see you guys next week. Hey everyone, Brian Chambers from the Frankfurt office. And this week we have... Tom Johnson. <laughs> so yeah, we're combining UK and Frankfurt this week. Um, we haven't told the editors they're going to put it together. We'll just dump it to them and see what they do with it. Um, so this week, uh, teams working hard as they always do when I say that every single week. At the end of last week, though, we had Bar Citizen. Yeah, a bit of a minded and 
I think this is a global thing, isn't it? Where all, yeah, the, yeah. all the studios took a moment to meet up with you guys and had a lot of fun in Wilmsow. And I, I hear you guys did too here. It's Absolutely. Really good, good opportunity to get some face time with the guys. And yeah, yeah. I think we had in Frankfurt, we had about 85 uh, backers there. Um, and it was awesome. We had probably 20 members of the team went out, hung out, had drinks, talked, chatted. Um, the energy from the backers, um, at least for me personally and the other guys were there. I mean, you know, if you're buried in your work and sometimes the details and there's stress mm -hmm. and so on, it's like feeling that energy from the backers, knowing how excited they are and how pumped they are. I mean, it totally pushes yeah, us. Yeah, it reminded me of Citizen kind of a little bit where you yeah. kind of, it'd been a while obviously since that event and kind of reminded you about all the passion that the, the backers have got. And that. Yeah, yeah. That definitely spurs you on when you go back to the office on like we did on uh, Monday, just following this one, and yeah, um, yeah, we should do more of them. I think you guys, had, you guys were in a big bar as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we we picked a bar in Wilmsow, and um, uh, yeah, we just sort of hung out with them, and it was it's almost like a very strange speed dating. <laughs> yeah, no, it was very similar. I had some people that <laughs> were like, okay, well, I'm here. What's the agenda? I'm like. Mm -hmm. The agenda is to hang out and talk. Yeah, it wasn't even like always about Star Citizen. It was just yeah, nice yeah. to see the guys' backgrounds and uh, what it is they do and yeah. you know, just, just sort of get to know each other. So, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, it was cool. It was fun. And one guy, I forgot, I actually I don't remember his name, but he gave me a, a version of the infinite, infamous 24-hour uh, stream lamp. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I saw him show up with this lamp and he hand, he's like, do you want the lamp? And I'm like, I can't take your lamp, no way. And he's like, no, I have a couple of them, I think you should have it. So yeah, we now in, in Frankfurt have a copy of that. So um, one thing I think we could, you know, we could jump on and we've talked about in the past, since Germany and the UK are close together in time zone. We work really close together. Yeah, it's nice to have a European partner now. Like when you're waiting for the American studios, we've got like yes. someone else to, to help out and, and get in the trenches on some issues. And yeah, I think um, obviously there's overlap with some of our teams as well. Yep. And being in the same time zone helps with uh, likewise with, you know, one studios leading the way like yeah. Francesco and the AI team and yeah. we've got a counterpart Rich on our end and, absolutely um, and we see that all over like you know Caleb for effects yeah he's our only effects artist here in Frankfurt and I think we we, we may have some more lined up but um, mm -hmm. he's reporting into the UK and that's where he's tasked and his stuff is reviewed and so on so I think we, so far we're getting it took us a little while but we're getting that yeah, synergy yeah working. it definitely feels like we're sort of yeah. getting into a better momentum now with with the team structure absolutely yeah. and even like I mean with Tom here right now he's only here for a few days but hop on a plane hour and 20 minute hour and a half flight whatever it is you know now he can sit down he's working with Alex other senior producer here where they're looking at the schedules and, and tearing apart what mm -hmm. the, the rainy main bits they need to to get it all put together and yeah tight, there's, the, there's the, like the actual collation of the data is the one thing and then there's also like getting the process unified and standardizing how we actually yep. display this stuff so there's some things that you kind of take for granted that aren't that simple to just kind of expect everyone else to, to do right off the bat. So sometimes Absolutely. it takes a bit of discussion and consensus. To yeah, and I, I would honestly say I think that's one thing that we continue to do and we probably will continue to do for a while, I mean maybe forever, is always finding ways to improve the communication, improve the, the processes in place to make sure the communication's there straight, the yeah. schedules are clear and concise, the yeah. dependencies are clearly laid out, because mm. with, with a, a project this big, I mean, there's tons of detail in there that, you know, people like Tom and the other guys really need to sort out to make sure that we can, you know, that we can uh, pull off what we want within the time that we want. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces there, and we're such a talented team, we don't want to let them down by, you know, lack of communication, you really want to make them sort of set up to succeed, and yeah, yeah. Um, that sort of comes through good organisation and structure, and Absolutely. makes everyone's lives a lot easier, so yeah. Yeah, it's great to have um, such a kind of um, nice working relationship now, I guess, with, yeah, yeah. with you guys. It's your first time out here too. Huh? Yeah, first time in Frankfurt. <laughs> Slightly early flight at four o'clock in the morning. I was getting up. <laughs> nice. Yeah, kind nice. of propped up by the caffeine today, but um, yeah. yeah, it's great to meet everyone in person as well who have not met before. So. Absolutely, and that's one thing too that I find interesting when I meet the other guys in person. I feel like I've already met them in person. Yeah. Because we're in these meetings all the time, these you know uh, video conferences and so mm -hmm. on. So 
once you're out and meet him face to face, you're like, oh wait, we've never met. Yeah, it adds a human element to it. It's nice to absolutely. Sort of actually yeah, in um, later this week too, or actually coming in later tonight, we have um, Chris is coming out, Aaron's coming out. Um, we're going over more things on the procedural tech, which I know I keep hinting on. Um, we're going to look at the schedules that you know Tom and Alex have been in, put together. Um, we're also having a couple of the designers from your team come out, yeah. um, Luke and Carl. Um, they're just coming for face-to-face -face time with our design team because our design team is getting bigger over here between level design and system design. So again, they can sit down, have face-to-face, -face, talk over mechanics, talk over stuff that they're tuning, look at you know their plans and, and what else they have to do. So. Cool. Yeah. Anything else from you? No, just um, good to be here, I guess, and, yeah. and uh, keen to uh, get everything nailed down with Alex this week. So awesome. Yeah, that should be good. Cool. Thanks again for uh, watching, playing, backing, all that stuff, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Next up, Jared highlights another community content creator in this week's wonderful world of Star Citizen. Let's meet Board Gamer and find out about the work he's been doing on Star Citizen tutorials. Today I wanted to talk about Windows 10 and how it compares to Windows 7 and 8 for stability, gaming performance and Star Citizen. But Star Citizen can be quite a complex and daunting undertaking, especially for new players. This starter tutorial should help guide you from creating an account, to grabbing your first ship, to buying weapons and piloting in some dogfights, as well as highlighting some of the experiences available in the baby persistent universe. Welcome everybody once again to the wonderful world of Star Citizen. I'm your host, Community Manager Jared Huckabee. And on this week's show, we're sitting down with Star Citizen YouTuber, Mr. Board Gamer. Board, how you doing, man? I'm very good, thanks. I'm all dressed up in my Operation Pitchfork gear. I saw that. Um, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> it's no problem. Now, do I call you Board? Do I call you Mr. Gamer? What do I call um, you? So yeah, it, it, either board, uh, board gamer, or monkey. That's that's basically what I'm known as mostly in the community. All right, thanks, Tim. So I'm sitting here with Tim, and we're talking about his. <laughs> I just wonder, is he laughing? I, I can't actually see him. I hope he's laughing. All right. So board gamer is a Star Citizen YouTuber. He's got a channel dedicated to Star Citizen videos that he's had for mm -hmm. some time. Uh, he does tutorials, all kinds of stuff. You know, let's let him tell us about it. Board, Tim. Mr. Gamer, Monkey, uh, tell us about your, who you are and what your channel does. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I'm Tim, or Board Gamer, <laughs> apparently now. Let's just run with Tim. Uh, basically, I try to run a channel focused on Star Citizen and VR and technology, all with a slight taste for at least Star Citizen in some way, um, with quite short kind of time frames is the idea. So people are going to be able to get guides, tutorials, gameplay videos, and learn something while watching my videos in the shortest space of time possible is the idea. Um, so we'll be exploring mods, hardware, um, how to do stuff in the Star Citizen world, whether that's um, the latest news that's come out or uh, the latest patch and what you can do in that latest patch. Anything like that really will do some form of Star Citizen video on it. Gotcha. And your, your channel has existed before Star Citizen. Uh, what did you yes. used to do? Um, so originally I started um, with Let's Plays and that sort of stuff. Um, it evolved into more informative content from Diablo 3, like how-to guides. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I really found my niche. I went, I'm quite good at giving information in a short period of time. Um, so I started doing uh, Diablo 3, uh, Titanfall and games like that. Uh, then I got really into VR and uh, eventually I... I picked up on this game, Star Citizen, um, from Chris Roberts, and I loved Wing Commander when I was very young. Um, and uh, I got myself an Aurora, and then upgraded it to an Avenger, and uh, here we are, D Star, Star Citizen dedicated now. <laughs> now, you've got, you've got quite a few Star Citizen videos now, and there's one that even has over 100,000 views? Yes, yes. Um, so hey, tell that's, us about that video. Uh, talking more about um, ships and roles in the verse, going over quite an in-depth look of exactly what uh, 
the dream for Star Citizen is and what we should be able to do in the future with bounty hunting, with uh, piracy, with mining, all those kind of mechanics and what ships are appropriate at what tiers. So I've kind of come up with my own ideas as well, um, which is, is explained in there because mm. there's only so much information we can go on by, especially this video is a, a little bit older now. It's almost a year old. Um, so please take it with a pinch of salt if anything's slightly out of date. <laughs> right. Uh, now, you're, you're pretty much, you're almost a full-time YouTuber. Is that a thing, a full-time YouTuber? I am indeed a full-time right. YouTuber. Okay. Uh, what did you do before you started you know, making your living on YouTube videos? Yeah, so uh, originally, uh, a good few years ago, I started with um, running cyber cafes, then doing bespoke computers. Uh, more recently, I went into um, running restaurants, uh, being a chef. Uh, and I left that because it was incredibly stressful <laughs> and uh, started up the YouTubes. And now it's become a, basically a dream job for me. Gotcha. Now, there are a lot of Star Citizen YouTube channels out there. What yep. separates your channel from everybody else's? Um, so I'm a little bit of a scamp uh, in my videos, so you'll get ones where I'm being uh, as informative as possible in a short period of time as possible. We've got the news and we've got the guides and tutorials, but also when I do gameplay and when I do stuff um, where I can do a bit of role play, so some mechanics I'll try and explain uh, from the point of view of the character. Um, I've got some videos up like that where I do, pretend I'm a pirate, for example, with a group of people, um, or uh, a bounty hunter or whatever. I, uh, I try and play it in my more um, my gameplay style, which is quite erratic and uh, I'm very talkative, and I, I try and get what I want in those videos in, um, in quite a naughty, scampy fashion. <laughs> All right. And uh, do you have a favorite video of yours? Like if, if someone wanted to check out Board Ooh. Gamer, was there one video they should check out first? Um, I really like my tutorial videos, to be honest. Right. Um, uh, just a, a simple quick controls guide one. Um, possibly, I, I did one about stowaways on board ship, um, where I lose my ship, and then our other ships get killed by the guy that's just stolen my ship. That's probably one of the more fun gameplay ones. Okay. And uh, some, some basic Star Citizen background. What's your favorite ship in Star Citizen to fly? So it's kind of two at the moment that, that exist in the game at the moment. Okay. Uh, I have a lot of love for price to performance ships. So the Avenger Titan, I absolutely love. That ship is really cost effective. It allows you to do so much in the verse. Mm -hmm. But I also have a lot of love for the 325A because I learned to fly in it. And even against very good pilots, I can still be relatively competitive in it. Okay. All right. And you've played Star Citizen, you've played Arc Corp, Arena Commander, Crusader, whatnot. What's mm -hmm. your favorite thing to do in the game now? Pretty much anything um, socially with multiple people, whether that's uh, multi-crewing a ship or um, a PvP or uh, making our own missions up and flying around the verse and then going to Korea and all that sort of stuff. Anything in a large party of people. I, I, I'm so about the socialization and the multiplayer. Uh, and this game has so much on so many levels that, that interacts on so many levels with it. And I, yeah, I'm super hyped for, for the, everything in the future. But at the moment, just... The party system at the moment excited me so much. <laughs> Fair enough. And what's one thing you're looking forward to most in the future of Star Citizen? Oh, I mean, there's just, so just much. I mean, just procedurally generated planets, the economy. I, there's, there's too many. I am an economy player by heart, though. So it has to be implementation of the economy, trade, mining, that sort of stuff is, is so exciting for me. You told me in our pre-interview you'd be happy sitting down and just watching your UEC run in. Yeah, so I love the idea of being able to mastermind situations. If you can, I love digital currency in, in my virtual bank account. Literally watching that tick in is, is just kind of like a silly dream to me. If I can do that sitting in a bar or chatting to people or watching something on my second screen and, and playing the game simultaneously, that I think that's an amazing thing. If I get NPCs and other players to do it for me, that's, that's just great. Living the dream. All right. So now if there's, well, before we let you go, is there one message you want to share with the Star Citizen community? Um, so at the moment, Star Citizen is all about 
more people playing the game and getting more people into the community. I want Star Citizen to be as friendly as possible between the community creators and fans and the viewers alike. And the, the more people that want to work with each other, the more people that want to get into content creation, um, the more people that just want to report on bugs on the game, it all helps us have a, a, an amazing game altogether. And uh, people's feedback to me, uh, Anything they want to give me for feedback, it's really appreciated and genuinely, genuinely really helps me. So thank you so much, guys, for, for letting me do what I love, um, which is Star Citizen and, and this YouTube channel. Thanks so much. What a stupid answer. I hate you. <laughs> I was kidding. I was kidding. All right, Tim, uh, well, thank you for taking the time to, to, to sit down and talk, talk with us here on the wonderful world of Star Citizen. Uh, you can check out uh, Board Gamer's YouTube channel at Board Gamer UK. It's on YouTube, if that wasn't obvious at this point. And that's all we got, man. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Uh, back it's to you, Ben and Sandy. Say it's been an experience. It's been an experience. Hey everybody and welcome back to Around the Verse Behind the Scenes. Today we're doing Sub Corner. It's where we take a look at some of the flair that our subscribers get each and every month. Joining us for the show today are two of our friends from Behavior. Behavior is one of our development partners up north in Canada. Uh, guys, thanks for joining us on the show. Why don't you tell folks who you are? Hi, I'm Jesse Kalb. Hi, I'm Simon Pichette. I'm sorry, your name was? Simon Pichette. Smoke, hi. How you guys doing? Very good, very good. Really you? Good, you? good. Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, now, before we get into talking about what this month's subscriber flare is, why don't you tell folks a little bit about what you do in general for behavior? Uh, me, I'm a 3D artist. I'm doing the modeling and the texturing. And I'm a level designer. For I add all the flare into the hangers. All right, cool. Cool. Now, now we've done a lot of flair in the past. We've done little ship models. We've done uh, the Puglisi collection where we we had space rocks and space debris and stuff. We're getting ready to introduce a new set of subscriber flair this month with our space plant collection. Now, the space plant collection was a was was actually a suggestion from the fans. We had had a, a stretch goal item where we did the the Xion plant, and when we asked our subscribers what other kinds of flair they'd like. Uh, additional plants was 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 a very popular choice so we're happy to take that into account we're starting our new space plant collection uh what can you guys tell us about the collection overall uh, all the plants will be pretty different from different origin i think that's going to be very cool very cool. and a lot of them some of them will move some of them might not uh some of them will be animated so there's a lot of things that we're going to see in the future animated plants right like some, well, some of them will grow. Some of them might move with certain types of music. Really? All right. Nice. I, have you ever seen that movie, Little Shop of Horrors, with the big plant that grows and eats people? Yeah, I like, really hate that movie. <laughs> 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 well, just, right. that part, just that part. Uh, now, uh, what, what's what's the first plant that's coming into the game right now? The, is it the the, the Xion plant? The, the space flower and the Xion plant. Okay, so we're, we're two, the, the uh, stretch goal plant and then the first of the subscriber flare. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. What can you tell us about the Xion plant? Uh, it's a beautiful plant. It's like a bonsai plant with a little bit of whimsical atmosphere, uh -huh. alien stuff. 
Okay. Uh, with the little glows in the leaves. That's a beautiful plant. Yeah. And what about the space flower? Uh, very contrast colored. Uh, it, it glows too. And uh, yeah, that's a beautiful plant too. <laughs> uh, smaller than the Xian one. Okay. And what are your roles in developing these plants? I'm doing the modeling and the textures. And then after the art's done, I'll take it into the editor and I'll place them in all the hangers and then I'll add the spawners so that uh, when you have the actual proper item code, it'll spawn in your hanger. Gotcha. And there's a lot of work behind the scenes with item codes and web codes and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Well, we just have to make sure everything's done properly so they don't get it too early or subscribers don't not get them at all. So <laughs> after we make sure, I usually test it in, in release after just to make sure everything's okay. Okay. And how long does it take to create one of these from start to finish? Five days approximately. All right. Yeah. What do I uh, think, well, Jesse? After that's done, um, it takes me about a day just to get into all the hangers, make sure again, make sure they all spawn properly, make sure the lighting's okay. Pretty much that's it. Gotcha. Now, why are some of these not as easy as, as others? I mean, we've done a lot of hanger flare, but, but my understanding is that some, some flare is a little more difficult to do than others. Well, for these, there's a lot of items that we had to put into a prefab. So there's a lot of lights, there's a lot of textures, and then we also added uh, the AR point of interest. So now when, you, when you're when you in uh, first person and you look at the plants, there'll be some info that you'll see. Oh, cool. uh, so we had to add that and we had to make sure it works properly. And they also rotate. <laughs> okay. So there's a lot of things going on. So the plants, they rotate, They some of them grow, some of them dance with music. Not these, but yes, in the yeah. future, possibly. <laughs> All right, so, so it's, not, it's not just as simple as building a plant and sticking it in the hangar then. Now, we already mentioned uh, some differences in the plants. Some grow, some, some maybe dance or whatnot. Uh, these plants all come from different planets, different star systems. What are some of the ideas you've had for different planets, uh, or different planets, geez, uh, for different plants? Uh, how do they differ from each other? What's some of the craziest ideas you've had? Oh, uh, some plants will have a, a lot of VFX, some less VFX uh, from uh, dry, uh, dry ground, um, different origins. Uh, the mood would be different too. Uh, the color, more contrast, less color. That's uh, yeah. Oh. And for up for the design side, we also we came up with a lot of ideas, and we also brainstorm a lot of ideas and ask the community to see what they would want the most. Uh, so we definitely have a lot of crazy things that we're thinking of, and some of them like we we actually just couldn't do because it just wouldn't work in the engine or in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to scale back on some of those, but we still have a lot of crazy things coming up. Gotcha. So, so these two plants are just where we're starting, and 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 things will go from here with the next uh, what six plants? Uh, five. Six five, more. Yeah. Plants? Five plus two. Five, yeah. five plus two. Okay. Seven total. <laughs> yeah. I'm not math. Nobody's ever looked at me and said I'm math. Well, guys, thanks for taking the time to sit down with us and chat for a bit. It's always cool when we get to feature behavior on our show. That you guys are an amazing partner, and we love working with you guys. So thank you so much for the work that you do. Uh, for those of you watching, uh, the first of your subscriber flare space plant will appear in your hangers tomorrow. Uh, these plants are for subscribers only. If you're not a subscriber for any reason, you can, of course, subscribe. Uh, we have multiple plans, and you can get your plant, you know, get your plant. Get a plant. Plants are cool. They make hangers look pretty. Get a plant. Get a plant. Subscribe. Go get a plant. Alexis is just shaking her head now for me. <laughs> Hey, you caught it. All right, guys, that's it for the It's time to end the segment. Uh, see you later, everybody. Uh, back to you, Ben and Sandy. Thanks, bye. Thank you, bye. bye. Guys at Behavior are amazing partners, and we'll be sharing more of their work in the coming weeks. But wait, there's more. We have one additional segment that we're trying out. Here's something we're calling the Lore Maker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sherry Heiberg, the archivist at Cloud Imperium Games, and I'm here with the first episode of the Loremaker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is a new segment 
about the lore and science be behind each system and planet in our game. So now that we're here, let's get started. Our first system, and one of my personal favorites, is the uh, Horus system. Which is a uh, M-type main sequence star, also known as a red dwarf, with three planets, two asteroid belts, and uh, four jump points. Two going to Xi'an space, and two going to UEE space. Now, Horus was discovered, whoops, there we go, let's go right back there. <laughs> Horus was discovered in um, 2528 by a young explorer named Marie Sante. Uh, she ran away from home at a very young age, stealing a ship from her parents, called the Horus, which she later named the ship after. Um, she explored for some time. It's rumored that she discovered the system when she was around 14 years old and spent the intervening years charting everything there, like these two planets, the asteroid belts, and this outer planet right here. When she first discovered the system, two of the jump points were as yet undiscovered. Those were the two ones that were going to Xi'an space. So as far as she knew at the time when she reported the system as being discovered to the UPE, it would be just a new system in regular UPE space without any political importance whatsoever, which was, of course, completely thrown out of whack in 2542 when she herself discovered the jump point to Rila, which, where do we have that? Boop, 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 right here. This goes to a close-by Xi'an system. Well, it may as well just jump through it so we can see it. this giant star and all these planets. And of course that made it immediately militarily important because this was during the Cold War, during the Messer era when the Xi'an and the humans were very calmly at each other's throats. The uh, resulting kerfuffle from that discovery led the UPE to declare Horus a totally military quarantine system. And so the few settlers who were on the first planet, they, they just didn't really care. They said, fine, we won't fly around. We'll just stay here on our planet. But Marie Sante was very upset because the system was her baby. So she refused to evacuate and just took her ship into the outer reaches of the system and continued to explore, which led to a, an incident with the military uh, <laughs> A Navy explorer, a, no, a Navy ship found her in the system and reported an unidentified ship and reported that to the UPE, which resulted in this, this military skirmish. No, no casualties or anything, but the incident was so obnoxious that they really wanted to pressure her to leave the system, and that's when they started to do that in earnest. So, duly pressured, in around 2545, Marie Sante vanished without a trace. She believed that the system had more secrets to discover, and she vowed that she would never share them with anybody. So who knows whether she did discover a new secret. Uh, the mystery of Marie Sante is something that draws tourists to the system, like people who are interested in, in unsolved mysteries, just like we are today. Marie Sante was right about one thing, though, that there was another jump point to Xi'an space, Kefa, which is right there looking all valuable to the military, strategically valuable. Anyway, after the Cold War ended, uh, the system that was once considered a really boring place for military ships to you know, fly around and make sure no Xi'an were invading, became all of a sudden a really economically valuable system because it had these two jump points that were going straight to Xi'an space. Great for commercial interests. And so Serling, this first planet right here, which is only settled along the solar terminator. Let's talk about the star itself, Horus. This is an M-type main sequence star, which is popularly known as a red dwarf. You may have seen or heard of a show called Red Dwarf. <laughs> um, these stars are interesting. They're uh, some of the most common in the galaxy. They are the longest life by far. I believe that we've never actually seen one die which is an in insane thing. They're billions and billions and billions of years old, and we've seen all kinds of other stars die, but never a red dwarf. 
when they first start out, they're often really unstable and have lots of flares, uh, which is the, the situation in pyro, just to have a little incidental piece of knowledge there. Um, and the flares will go out like really, really far and they'll scorch planets and they'll make systems just totally uninhabitable and really uh, hostile to any kind of person who wants to make a living there or explore there. But the star in Horus has long since settled its, uh, its adolescent period, I guess. <laughs> uh, the, the flare star period tends to last around 1.2 billion years. And then they settle down into something really steady and really good for the possible development of life. They're cool. They tend to be about half the temperature of stars like our sun, which are G-type main sequence stars, yellow dwarfs. We really, really wanted more systems that had this type of star, since this star is so common. And we had tended to lean towards G and F type stars in the other systems. And so this was one of the earlier ones that we came up with that had this, this type of habitability model. The first planet in the system is Serling. And I'm sure that a lot of you picked up that it was named for Rod, Rod Serling, the host of the Twilight Zone because it is only habitable along the twilight band of the planet. Ah. <laughs> um. <laughs> this was added to the game because we had recently discussed with a local scientist and read a little bit about these particular type of planets that, are real, that circle very, very close to M-type stars, and they are, in fact, tidally locked to the planet. Um, the animation so far doesn't reflect that, but it will in the future. That's one of the goals for making the star map more visually accurate to reflect the lore that we have in the game. Um, Serling itself, it's, it's locked around the equator. And so one side of the star, is, one side of the planet is just permanently facing the star. And it's, it's warm and it's got lots of driving winds and it's full of, there's a lot of storms, especially on the point that's closest to the star. There's storms constantly. And then on the other side of the planet is permanent night zone. It's a polar ice cap. There's really not, not anything that lives there. Um, the abundant oceans on Serling, again, this is something that we will correct in the future visually, will make, make a, the habitable zone possible. Without the abundant oceans, it might just be this really weird planet that's baked on one side and ice on one side and nothing would happen. But luckily for life, we have this, this one little strip of planet where people can live. The people who live on Serling, they tend to commute from the night to day side to simulate the night day cycle that Serling totally lacks. And that they'll work on the day side and they'll sleep on the night side. This is just along the solar terminator, by the way. This isn't going to be, these people won't be stuck in storms forever on one side and ice forever on one side. It's generally, a, it's more temperate in the Bright Meridian than anywhere else on the planet. Um, a lot of people who are natives of Serling, who have been there um, for many, many generations, don't really care too much about going back and forth between the day and night cycle. They're used to living in this permanent sunset, which is pretty cool person, I think. <laughs> there is a study going on at the University of Aten, which is located on Serling, that's kind of assessing the effects of what this cycle does to people, how it affects their mood, how it affects their productivity, how it affects their quality of life. Because the habitable zone of Serling is so narrow, uh, it, it's got a pretty low population, and businesses that want to get a foothold in the system so that they can trade with the Xi'an more easily have kind of a tough time muscling their way in. Which brings us to the second planet in the system, Horus II. Has no name because it has no settlement. It is currently a desert planet. There's no water that we know of on it. But it is a viable terraforming candidate. It sits just at the edge of the green zone. And because of this, a lot of the businesses that want a foothold in Horus are really pushing the government to try to get this terraform so that they can settle in and open up trade relations with the Xi'an. Um, it's a little bit more massive than a lot of small planets, um, which would give it a better chance of being terraformed since it's right on the edge of the green, the green band. 
Now, zooming out, we can see the first asteroid belt. Both asteroid belts in the system are pretty sparse, which is honestly really common for a lot of asteroid belts. There um, are probably going to be some mining opportunities there in the future. Uh, certainly mining opportunities that you can exploit to uh, further trade relations with the Xi'an, for example, since they're right there. Um, the system does see a good bit of Xi'an traffic sometimes. Um, whoops, I uh, went all the way out again. All right, our last planet in the system is uh, Horus 3, right over here. This planet is special, it's a super Jupiter. Uh, super Jupiters are, they are gas giants that are more massive than Jupiter, that's the definition of them. But this gas giant is about four times as massive as Jupiter. It is one of the most massive Super Jupiters that are in our game, which can be very interesting uh, in gameplay. It kind of sits on the outskirts of the system, uh, being large, being in charge, <laughs> being desolate because there's no life there, but uh, it could be a place to refuel, that kind of deal. So anyway, um, that's about it for Horus. I hope you enjoyed this uh, behind the scenes look at one of my favorite systems because of it, the cool science behind it. Um, it's got a rare tidally logged habitable planet, it's got four jump points, and it's got a rare super Jupiter. So, got some neat science going on, good culture, Horus, yay. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks for tuning in. Um, I had a really good time talking about the system and I hope to see you guys again. Um, thanks as always for being awesome people, uh, for subscribing and for making all this possible. You might say that's really the sherry on the top of this episode. Not going there. I'm just not. And we can't leave without an MVP. The envelope, please. Do we have an envelope? Bum, ba, ba, ba. Yay! Well done to Alexis for spelling MVP correctly. And the winner is Canito. Yay! For his video Radar Globe 2.0. In this video, Canito showcases features already available in the current Radar Globe and includes suggestions of his own on how to improve it going forward. I have a good authority that our own uh, UI expert, Zabian, has seen this video. He says that's good stuff, and he'd like us to remind everyone that uh, we are always looking for talented UI designers. So uh, check the Cloud Imperium Games job page. But uh, thank you, Canado. You are this week's MVP. Canedo, Canedo. Um, apologies if we're pronouncing this incorrectly. And of course, it wouldn't be around the verse without this week's art sneak peek. Ben, what is it? It's this. Be sure to tune in to Reverse the Verse tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific on Twitch, where we'll be discussing that and all sorts of other Star Citizen full facts. Thank you, as always, to all of our subscribers for making this show possible. We will see you next week on Around the Verse.
Did you know that many of Star Citizen's developers are on social media? If you would like to follow Star Citizen on Facebook, you can find us here. Or on Twitter, here. And even Instagram, here. And for a full list of developers' personal accounts they're willing to share with the community, check out this link. You can find out uh, what I bought at Amazon this week. Star Wars stuff. It was, yeah, it was probably Star Wars stuff. Star Wars stuff.